Hey everybody, it's Phil Ralston from 10 o'clock service on Sunday. Coming to you from Victoria Island, British Columbia, near Vancouver. We are in their part, their Chinatown. Pretty cool space, a lot of shops, a lot of restaurants. Anyways, get out and see the world, man. Hope you enjoy service with Pastor Diane. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Phil. Welcome to Worship at Christ, the servant from our living room to yours. We are honored that you have chosen to worship with us in this way today. So turn up the volume and let's get started. We come from far and wide anticipating Gathered in this place and now we're waiting Surrounded by your heavenly embrace Showering us with your abundant grace So we give it all to Graciousness amazes Accept our joyful gift of songs and praises We offer up our lives in service here Confident that you are always near So we give it all to music here express with never-ending mercy you will bless so we give it all to In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. We pray together. Dear Father, I ask you to give me strength to live this day as you would have me live it. Guide me in shining with the light of Jesus Christ in my words and actions. Fill me with your Spirit so that I may be for others an instrument of hope, peace, and love. Use me to bring joy to others so that they may understand the life you desire for all your children. Amen. God hears your prayer and fills you with the power to live today, tomorrow, and every day, enjoying new and abundant life. Live in newness of life. Amen? Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace 
release my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers toils and snares I have already come tis grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home the Lord has promised good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures when we shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first be The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Eternal light shine in our hearts. Eternal wisdom scatter the darkness of ignorance. Eternal compassion 
have mercy on us. Turn us to seek your face and help us to reflect your goodness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 7 through 9. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together a great company. They shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble, for I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So we're hearing of a a smaller section of a section within the prophet Jeremiah, a section called the Book of Comfort, and that's chapters 30 through 33. And we're here obviously in chapter 31. So we're having a little part of those, of those books that are called the Book of Comfort. Now, the thing is that most of what else Jeremiah had to share, which he was a prophet giving God's message to the people, were difficult words Um, and so they had been important for the people to hear because they had to learn and understand in what was wrong but also they're in hearing how important that is it's also very important to be given hope you know just like any going to any doctor because you know you're not well you, you you know you've been feeling off and feeling kind of sick and then they have to maybe even do some tests and things And then finally you find out, okay, now you know what's going on. And you're offered an opportunity for for that to change, for there, so that gives you hope. There's a sense of um, renewal or maybe uh, getting back to some of the activities, part of the life that you've had to let go for a while because you've been under the weather. So that is what God's people had been going through. They had come under judgment. They had been taken far from home. And out of that loss, they were feeling quite low. So in the midst of that, Jeremiah gives this message of hope. The people were longing for for a restoration. And that's the kind of message that Jeremiah gives to them, that there will be a homecoming, there will be a restoration, a, a rebuilding and a restoring, a renewing of relationship. And the vision of this is a little bit like when God's people were rescued out of slavery in Egypt only this time and that was when they went on a journey through the wilderness to get to the promised land. Now it will be another kind of journey, another kind of rescue, this time from captivity in Babylon and they will be guided to come home. But the very specific change or difference between uh, in the journey from Egypt, the focus was on Uh, leaving behind slavery. But on this particular journey, what is really brought out is that no one is left behind. So it's not so much what, what they're about, what they're leaving behind, which was slavery when they left from Egypt. But in this case, it's more about how everyone will be included. So it's more about inclusion. So this is what is envisioned so that even those who may have certain limitations, uh, even those who are vulnerable, they will be given the strength that they are needed. But very importantly, I think, again, that reconnecting that sense of community, that everyone is together and how that matters to God so that everyone all get to go home again. I like to uh, watch sometimes on the PBS in the television on the weekend, a show called This Old House. And it's about how people are restoring or trying to rebuild part of their house. And it's, it's also fun to see what they, what they go through and the owners have to learn a lot of things. But you know, that's also what our journey of faith is like. It's not ever go back to the way things were, but looking to God, relying on God, 
and putting our trust in God, that God is going to lead us to that renewed place in our faith and in our relationship with God and in our relationship with one another, and especially to put in our own hearts that sense of compassion and make sure that everyone can come and is included in that journey. Our Psalm for today is Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortune of Zion, then we were like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. That's a lovely little phrase, shouldering their sheaves. I think there's a, I'm pretty sure there's a hymn that uh, includes that, that phrase in the, in the hymn. So restoration, that's what God's people were also looking for when they were in the captivity, when they were in Babylon. And perhaps this Psalm kind of is an echo of that. And God did help the people return, did help restore them to their, to their homeland. Now they didn't get to have their own king again. They weren't quite ever the very, very same independent nation as they had been before but at least they did get to return, they got to their homes. And again, in, as it says, rest, the fortunes of Zion were restored. And so when they did get to come back to Jerusalem and to the, the area, they were able to find their homes, perhaps even find uh, relatives that they hadn't seen for a very long time, uh, things that they had missed and lost, and also rebuilding their temple, the way of worship that they hadn't been able to, they could still worship God because they knew God was with them even when they were far, far away. But to be able to carry out the way of worship that they knew was what they were meant to do, to do it in the way that they didn't have to do it with another power with um, more control and their own set of gods and, and who is trying to coerce and push people to uh, come over and believe in their gods, that they, they didn't have to worry about that anymore, that that was the kind of joy. And what is amazing about this though, is of course it's understandable that God's people would feel joy because of this return, their laughter and their shouts of joy as we're told. Perhaps you've had an experience of, again, um, I think, again, I keep kind of comparing it to an illness, some kind of loss, or some kind of loss. And then that sense of returning to health or perhaps that sense of being close to God again when perhaps that had seemed as though God was far away. And so in that restoration, there is such joy in that moment. Well, what's amazing in the Psalm though, that the Psalm also celebrates is not just the people's joy, but even the nations stand and also will be marveling at what God has done because then they also can give praise to God. So God's goodness, God's faithfulness, God's dedication to restore the people, to bring them back to their homeland, to their place of their faith and living as God's people together. That was something that was really and truly amazing. Well, there's all kinds of stories of res restoration throughout the whole of the Bible. Uh, just to kind of highlight or touch on a few, when uh, Sarah had been separated from Abram, and so she was restored to Abram, and then when Joseph had been separated from his father and his brothers, although his brothers were the ones who sold him off to slavery and had him carried off to Egypt, but then later, much, much later, uh, he was able to be restored in his, his relationship with his brothers and with his father and to help them and to take care of them. Um, again, when the people had been slaves in Egypt and then they were restored and brought to the promised land that God had promised long before to Abram. And Jesus, of course, his birth, but also all of his teaching, his, his life, his miracles, and then his death and his life restored 
his resurrection, and we too are part of that. Times of life when we have turned away or we have been hurt or brought down, to always know that we have a God who brings that restoration and that there may be a time of the sorrow and there may be a time of the tears, but there will come again the time of joy. Our next reading is from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 through 28. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of other people. This he did once for all when he offered himself for us. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. So we are keeping along with the theme of what we heard also last week about uh, understanding Jesus as our priest or perhaps more correctly as the, the high priest. In the writing of Hebrews, it's probably to those who had come from a Jewish background and had come to believe in Jesus, but they also knew their traditions, their ways of worship. And so to help them grow in understanding how Jesus fulfills what the role of the priest was in their way of worship as Jews, but in a special and unique way so that they can see the connection between what was before and what Jesus does for, for all of us. Now, the priesthood is probably not something we're necessarily very, very familiar with. And by that, I mean the priesthood in the traditions of Israel and in the Jewish, Jewish faith, not something like Catholicism or um, Episcopalian, those, those communities that do tend to call their, uh, their leaders priests but it is something that was very meaningful in the history of Israel for many, many years. This was the way they were taught and understood they were to worship God, which would be to go to the priest and the priest could make an offering or a sacrifice and in doing so would help make things right with God, help restore them, we're still working on that word restore, uh, them to that relationship with, with God. Well but they were human. And of course, being human, they were not perfect. And also being human, their lives end. All of our lives, we are mortal. Our lives do end. But Jesus is able to do the ministry, what the priest is always supposed to do. And he is able to do this eternally. But again, he is also like us. Uh, we don't hear that emphasized quite as much in this passage, but I do appreciate very much how Hebrews likes to keep bringing out as much as Jesus is a high priest and he is eternal and he is there, as it says, in making intercession for us at all times, always, forever. But he is also, he has been a human and he fully understands and he fully has compassion. But what I appreciate about this focusing on his presence as a priest on our behalf before God in heaven is making that intercession for us, that he would help us at all times. He is on our side. Um, not that we have to think of God as an angry judge and that it has to be appeased, but because we are the ones who have strayed, we are the ones who have broken the relationship and so Jesus is the one who continually prays and is there to help save us, help continuing to restore that relationship with God 
and that we do not have to be afraid, but we have that one who is on our side and who is there for us and who is bringing us back into that very close relationship with our God, our Father, who does love us so very, very much. Our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Well, we've had other stories of healing throughout Mark's gospel, quite a few of them as a matter of fact. And this one is another one of those, but it also stands out as unique and special. Uh, it's like those stories, but it's also unique and special. What is similar is that very, very much, very likely, when there was the person needing healing, they were being pushed off to the side in some manner, or they were being isolated. Remember when the woman who had the bleeding for 12 years was desperate to be healed and she even kind of came after Jesus and thought, if I can just touch his, the hem of his garment, then I can be healed. Uh, she really wasn't even supposed to be in a, in a crowd of people. With her condition, she should have always been keeping herself separate from everyone else. And other kinds of ailments or difficulties or illnesses or infirmities, all of those sort of things were the kind of thing that would keep a person separated apart from community. And so we're told that this man, uh, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, by the way, there, I'm not sure exactly why because it's, it's a little bit funny because in the Aramaic, which was the common Hebrew language at the time of Jesus. So it was like Hebrew, but it was called Aramaic, and it was the common way of speaking Hebrew in Jesus' time. The word bar means son, and Timaeus would have been the father. So bar Timaeus literally means son of Timaeus. So what this passage says is son of Timaeus, son of Timaeus. But sometimes you're sharing something with people that you don't want to assume know your own, know that language. So you do translate it immediately just so that, to be sure everybody understands, everybody can hear and understand. So that reminds me in Tucson, Arizona, where there are a lot of things that are given a Spanish name because of the closeness to Mexico and just the time and the culture and the Spanish influence that was around that area. So there's a place, there's a river, and actually it's not a very active river in Arizona and in the desert in general. There's these places where water can flow when there's enough of it around, but otherwise it's a really wide stretch and there's no water in there. But this particular place where the water can flow and is called a river is called the Rito, Rito River. And what Rito is meaning in Spanish is little river. So I just thought that was kind of funny. It's the little river river. 
So it's just that same sort of thing. Sometimes when you're putting something from one language next to, you add what it is in the language that everyone mostly is more familiar with. So it's the Little River River. That's what Rito River means. Well, at any rate, um, he, this man, is sitting at the edge of the road. And that's, again, that's that commonality with the other stories of healing, how that person who is either missing their sight, perhaps, or perhaps they can't walk, perhaps they're very ill, they are pushed off to the edges, off to the margins. And so he's by the side of the road. But he, he learns that Jesus has come close. And what's so amazing is that he knows a lot about Jesus. Not sure how he learned this, or maybe even he knows something about Jesus, and maybe he's even being given some prophetic power, some ability to speak the truth about who Jesus is, because he is then the one and only, uh, at this up to this point, to refer to Jesus as the son of David. And that's really important because that is something, that's a reference that indicates that Jesus is the one who comes from the line of King David. And right after this story, right after this all happens, Jesus actually goes into Jerusalem. And what, hap what is going to happen is what we come to call Palm Sunday. Jesus is given the kind of welcome that is deserving of a king, where they put the palm branches in their cloaks and they're praising him, Hosanna to the son of David, that's the phrase. So Bartimaeus is kind of, again, speaking almost like a prophet, but he also is very much in need. He does need help. And so when he learns that Jesus is nearby, he begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then some people are trying to shush him. And again, that's the unfortunate thing. Just as the uh, first reading from Jeremiah shows that God has a special care for those who would be so easy for us in general, people in general, to push off to the margins, the people who are the vulnerable, the people who would maybe slow you down or something like that, and leave them, leave them behind. This is that kind of kind of reaction. That's what the people are are planning to do. It's like, no, no, don't get in the way. Let's just let's just keep going. But instead of letting them just just push him away he is more determined and in this case that reminds me again of that woman and her determination to seek healing from jesus he knows he needs this healing and he's not going to give up so he he shouts even more loudly jesus son of david have mercy on me well jesus does hear him and so he stops and he tells the crowd, call him here. Well, initially, so I wonder if some of these were the very same people who at first were trying to be like, like, go away, go away, don't bother Jesus, Shh, be quiet. Uh, all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay. The, you know, like then now they're on the side of trying to uh, bring the man, include the man. So now they actually begin to act out what the prophet Jeremiah did proclaim is looking out for those and making sure that everyone can be included. So they get on board with, with that approach, with that perspective. So they, they, they do reach out to the man. And I think that I love that part of this story is that they also get involved in a sense of his healing because they're now going to help him get to Jesus, you know, make it not difficult for him to reach Jesus, but to actually be able to come to Jesus. So when they give him that message, take heart, get up, he is calling you, then the, the man, he may not be able to see, but apparently his legs work really well because he jumps up and he goes right to Jesus. I'm sure this is where, again, the people in the crowd uh, were, were helping out. They were, they were helping guide him so that he could actually come, come up to Jesus. And then Jesus asks them, him, the man, this question. What do you want me to do for you? I don't know if that uh, brings something to mind, but very recently we had the reading where 
James and John had learned for the third time about how Jesus would be, he would, he would suffer, he would die, he would rise again, and Jesus had talked about this three times, and the third time, especially in, in more at length, more in detail. And at the same time, they had come to Jesus and said, uh, we, do, do, we want you to do what we ask. And Jesus basically said to James and John, what do you want me to do for you? Well, Jesus asked the same question of this man who was blind. What do you want me to do for you? He'd been crying out for mercy. Um, and we know because of his lack of sight that that's his greatest need is to be able to see. And so with Jesus, some encouragement, he says that. He says, my teacher, let me see again. There's all these uh, crisscross to pre previous events that we've been reading recently in Mark's gospel between around chapter eight through up th here through chapter 10. Remember the rich young man? He came to Jesus and he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was very concerned about what, what do I do? How do I raise myself up and be approved of by God? What do I do? But he had said, good teacher. But I think when the rich man, young man, said that to Jesus, he was more probably trying to flatter him, uh, kind of get Jesus to be positive towards him. Whereas I noticed there's a difference in what Bartimaeus says. He says, my teacher. And that is so important. He sees Jesus as the one who leads him, guides him, helps him, my teacher. It's about a connection. It's about a relationship. And that's what Jesus always was trying to invite the other man to do, to, to be in a relationship with Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus. Well, he says, he says what Jesus asked, and he asked, let me see again. And Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. He put his trust in Jesus. He understood and believed that Jesus was the one who in his mercy could radically transform his life. But perhaps almost a little more, as much as it's the joy and that healing and that restoration of his sight, as we keep focusing on that restoration word, but it's also a whole complete new direction in his life. It's really about a new beginning in his life. Remember Jesus asked the young man who had asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, keep all the commandments. That's what you need to do. And then he said, I did it. I already did that. And then Jesus said, well, okay, then sell all you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. Well, this man didn't, he didn't have a lot, that is true, but he didn't let anything hold him back at all from reaching Jesus. He drops his cloak, which again, that would have been so incredibly important and, and he, he, he would have needed that so, so badly. But even that very little that he had, but very, very critical thing that he had, a cloak, uh, to help protect him, keep him warm at night. I mean, very, very central and needed in his life. He left that behind to get to Jesus, to reach Jesus. And so Jesus says, you are made well. And he gets to see again, his life is, is renewed, his, his vision is restored. But most of all, what does he do next? He follows Jesus. I think he is the example of being a disciple that we don't necessarily see too often from the original 12. But he, he turns to Jesus. He understands uniquely who Jesus is and that Jesus is the one who is capable of transforming his life 
and that Jesus wants to transform his life. And he seeks that relationship with Jesus. He seeks to be his follower. And that's what we are also invited into, to understand how we can be followers just like Bartimaeus was. Longing for God's will to be fulfilled among us, we pray for the church, the world, and all people in need. Holy and faithful God, make your church complete through the redeeming work of Christ, our great high priest. Set us apart that we can bring reform, reformation into this world. Lord, we give you praise for you always hear us. Satisfy the needs of your creation through clean, flowing water, especially in dry, barren places. Bring rainfall in due measure and let it bring a blossom of life with it. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. Set your compassion in us and draw our attention to people who are often pushed to the side or too often neglected. Teach us how wide and powerful your mercy is. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. Gather those who are suffering and make well-being and salvation take root in their lives. Bring hope to those who are sick or suffering in any way. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. Enfold all things in your compassion, O God, and bring us into your life through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth, sing the glory of His name. Give to our God glorious praise, sing the glory of His name. How awesome are your deeds because of your great power, all the earth worships you. They sing praises to you, sing praises to your name. All the earth worships you. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to our God glorious praise. Sing the glory of His name. See what God has done and what God can do with you, and all will bless our God. Come here and I will tell what God has done with me, and all will bless our God. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth sing the glory of His name. Give to our God glorious praise, sing the glory of His name. How awesome are your deeds because of your great power, all the earth worships you. They sing praises to you, sing praises to your name, all the earth worships you. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth, sing the glory of His name. Give to our God glorious praise, sing the glory of His name. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth, sing the glory of His name. Give to our God glorious praise, sing the glory of His name. Sing the glory of His name. Sing the glory of His name. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you.
speaking these words. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for giving us new life, feeding us through Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Stay in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll worship together again next week. <laughs>